Well, let's uh, look at the handout. Again, we won't look at all of it, just make a couple points, <clears throat> tell a few stories along the way. I want to remind us what, what we're doing here at IHOP. I mean, we all know, but it's easy to forget what it is that we're doing here. Lord, I ask you just for a spirit of inspiration. I ask you for a spirit of impartation. Father, I ask you to strengthen our spirit with understanding now. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. I'm going to the uh, paragraph A, to the two words that the Lord gave at the very beginning, in 82 and 83, and I took me a few years to figure out it was really one message. They were a year apart about, but really the Lord was just pausing and says, I'll give you the first sentence in 82, and I'll pause and I'll give you the second sentence of the same message in 83. He said, I'm going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity in the earth in one generation. That was the most remarkable statement I've ever heard from the Lord. Then nine months later, the audible voice of the Lord, I will establish 24-hour prayer in the spirit of the tabernacle of David. I wasn't sure which one was the focus, but now I understand that the Lord, when the Lord was saying, I'm going to establish 24-hour prayer in the spirit of the spirit of tabernacle of David, he didn't mean just in Kansas City. He meant, I'm going to establish it. Wait and see across the whole earth. I will establish this, and that's one way I'm going to change the understanding and expression of Christianity in the earth in one generation. When you combine the two together, it's one big sentence. It's one message. Now, again, I want to remind us of what we're doing here, the the nobility of what we're doing. The devil is such a consistent liar that even the wisest ones among us can get foggy about the truth as to why the Lord sent them here. The nobility of our work. Our work is weak in the flesh. I'm talking about our work in the prayer room. We have 84 departments. We have, and all of our departments matter in terms of keeping the whole vision going. But I'm talking right now about one particular thing, the work that we do in the prayer room itself. I want to emphasize and and give you a few uh, uh, biblical principles as to the nobility of what we're doing. Whether you're a group singer on the microphone up front or you're on row 10 in the congregation running the soundboard, the work we are doing is so important to the Lord and our over-familiarity with the work can get us to lose sight as to what's really happening. Because we do it so much It's like, oh yeah, it's my set again, and we lose the nobility and the power of what we're doing. It's still powerful from God's point of view, but we don't feel it. And we can begin to uh, substitute other things for that work, and I want to assure you of one thing. There is no substitute for the work that we do in the prayer room. There is no substitute. Yes, there's a dynamic worship dimension. We love you, Lord, and you love us, and we express that. But in the overflow, we are doing the work of the kingdom, sitting in a chair on row 10, simply agreeing with what they sing or say on the microphone. That is actually moving things in the spirit. And because we get so familiar with it, we can lose sight that it's actually, uh, 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 from the word of God, the most significant way that Power is released in human history. I mean, you think, surely, Lord, that can't be true. But the Word of God makes it clear. So much more happens because we sit in that prayer room. Again, you're sitting there on row 10. You're a group singer. You're, in a, you're a musician. And what they say or sing on the microphone, you simply, you know, every couple of phrases, you just repeat it after they say it, and you say it to God. Don't say it just to the air actually say it to a person on the throne. And I'm telling you, so much happens. Now, one of the problems is that we can only measure the fruit effectively over years. You can't measure the fruit over weeks and months. Because when consistent prayer goes forward, an invisible hand begins to operate. I call it the divine magnet, where God begins to draw things 
wisdom, resource, people, unity, goodwill, uh, 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 resolution for righteousness. That magnet, which is not really a magnet, it's the Holy Spirit, but we can't see its force, is drawing us to the places where God wants us to be. So much happens because we uh, do that work in the prayer room, and the devil tells us we're wasting our time. The devil tells us this is too weak to really matter. But I want to tell you, look what the testimony of Scripture, the greatest man that ever lived, Jesus, John the Baptist, then Moses, Paul the Apostle, Elijah, they were mostly people of prayer before they were people of any other thing. How could the greatest people in human history, from salvation history, have prayer as their number one assignment and it not be the primary work of the kingdom? There's uh, many different ways to say this. Different preachers have said it different ways. But we don't just pray for our work. Our work is prayer. Now, not all of our work. We have other work that's beyond prayer. But prayer is work. And our work is prayer. It is the work of the kingdom. Jesus did more praying than he did preaching. So did John the Baptist. So did Moses. So did Elijah. I look at these uh, towering figures in history. Of course, Jesus had a category of his own. And Lord, what are you saying to us through their life? Here's what he's saying. That weak thing that you call prayer that you don't feel very much when you do, understand that heaven has a very different opinion than even my people on the earth do. Look at the noble ones of history and see what I am saying through them. Now, paragraph B, what is this restoring or, or prayer in the spirit of the tabernacle of David? Now, I, I gave a, uh, uh, a teaching some, a couple years ago, which I'm not going to go into. I gave 10 different aspects of what's involved in the spirit of the tabernacle of David. 10 different aspects. Because this is one of the premier prophecies related to the return of the Lord. In Amos chapter 9, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. I will raise it up. And even in this hour, the spirit of the tabernacle of David is being restored in the kingdom of God, in the church. Now, I'm not going to talk about the ten aspects of what I think the spirit of the tabernacle of David involves. I'll just mention one or two. It's ministry that is based in worship with intercession. That's the spirit of the tabernacle of David. The tabernacle of David is something bigger than worship. The tabernacle of David is actually the government of Jesus filling the earth at the millennial, at the second coming to initiate the millennial kingdom. That's when the tabernacle of David is restored. When Jesus literally comes in person to the earth, sits on a throne in Jerusalem, takes over all the governments of the earth. But here's the deal. He will base all the governments of the earth on worship and intercession. Meaning every single decree that goes forth will be joined to night and day prayer in the nations. Some people have the wrong idea that we pray a lot now and then when the Lord comes and everything's perfect, prayer's over. No, you will do much more praying in your resurrected body than you do now. Prayer is not just something we do till Jesus comes. It is the primary way forever that God will release the power of his kingdom. Jesus even now is releasing power through interceding. I mean, imagine Jesus is interceding with a resurrected body at the Father's right hand. That's how powerful intercession is. We don't have to feel the power of it for God to see the power of it. Because what I have found, we offer it in weakness... But it ascends before God in power. Because of the blood of Jesus, and because of the, the very fact that God decreed intercession to have this primary role in his kingdom, we offer it. Again, you're sitting on one of the chairs in the prayer room. And the guy sings or says something on the microphone, and you just simply agree with it. And what I try to do is about every second or third phrase, I try to just whisper it. Like when someone says, Lord, send revival and touch Detroit. I won't do every phrase, but I try to, when I'm not reading the word and talking to the Lord on another issue, I'll just say, I'll say with the guy on the microphone or what the person sang. I'll say, Lord, send re- touch what were, you know, the, the uh, work uh, in Detroit this Friday and Saturday. I'll just say, Lord, touch 
the call in Detroit. I just whisper it. And I think, surely that's not very powerful. And the testimony of Scripture is, it is. The fact that you can't see it, it takes as much faith to understand the revelation of intercession as it does any other facet of the kingdom. It takes faith. We kind of have this unspoken idea that if we feel it, then it's powerful. And so we end up gauging the effectiveness of our prayer by our emotions. God gauges the effectiveness of our prayer by our agreement with Him, not how we feel our emotions. We need to stay away from measuring the effectiveness and the power of prayer by our emotions, and we need to, by faith, engage with what the Word of God says is happening because God sees agreement. That's what He sees. We see, wow, the music was awesome. And there was a particular manifest presence and we all felt that that was a good one. And the Lord would say, it was no better than the other one from my point of view. I remember the, uh, I've told this testimony a number of times, but it just, I, I, go, I go back to it over and over again. And some t- uh, in the summer, it was in the late 80s, I went to uh, one of the Saturday morning prayer meetings and as I was uh, going to the prayer meeting, it was 8.30 in the morning. It was 8.30 prayer meeting in the morning. I was going about 15 minutes early. There were only two cars in the parking lot outside of the, the prayer sanctuary that we were, we were uh, having our prayer meetings in then. And I saw two cars there, and I thought, okay, I'm 15 minutes early. We normally had about 15 people that came to the Saturday morning prayer meeting. And so I am walking up to the door, and before I get to the door, I hear this, incredibly loud, like Handel's Messiah type music, this kind of, you know, big uh, music. And, uh, and I said, oh, no, they're on the inside and they're blowing out the sound system. And so I rush and grab the door because I thought, oh, this is, it was louder than I could have ever imagined the sound system could be. It, it, it would really hurt you. And when I, 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 I kind of ran fast and grabbed the door and opened it, and when I opened it, it was quiet. And I thought, what's going on? So I went into the sanctuary. There's only two guys there. I thought maybe they were playing with the sound system. But they were down on the front, both of them, and they were praying because one of them, their family member was sick, and they were very touched and engaged in it. And, and I thought... What was that? That hallelujah type thing I just heard. I mean, the, it's big. It was the, the angelic choirs. So I assumed this is going to be a, a prayer meeting like none I've ever been in. I mean, I've already heard the angelic choirs for a few moments. And wow. I mean, you, you, I wish I'd have had enough discernment to know when I heard it. It was the angel choirs instead of people messing with the sound system. But that's another story for another time. So the prayer meeting is going, and I think any moment now there's going to be this manifestation of power that we all feel that we'll talk about for years. And nothing. It's boring and dull like it always was. And so, you know, a few guys pray, and uh, it's same old kind of lazy Saturday morning dull prayer meeting that I went to for years. I didn't mind it, but that's just how it was. So I went up to pray, and I thought, Lord, release your power. And I got up, and it was, I felt oppressed. I mean, literally, I prayed it like it hit and bounced back, and I thought, well, that that wasn't the answer. And I sat in the chair, the prayer meeting was over, everybody left. I said, that is the strangest thing that's ever happened to me. I said, what was this? I sit there 15, 20, 30 minutes. I go, Lord, I am totally perplexed. I wasn't even trying to overly figure it out. I just said, there is no answer. And the Lord gave me the clearest communication. He said, this is what always happens every Saturday morning when you gather in a dull prayer meeting. The angel choirs are involved like this every single time you gather. Every time 10 people gather and offer their prayer, it doesn't move them, but it moves God and it moves the angels. So we need to intentionally Begin to engage faith. I mean confidence that our weak prayers move God the way the Bible says they move God. Because accidentally, inadvertently, we measure 
the effectiveness of our prayer by our emotion in that prayer meeting. And the Lord would say, where in the word of God does it say that's the grid? Well, I don't know. It just seems like when you feel it, if I feel it more, God, you must feel it more. And the Lord says, no. When you feel it more, it's a blessing. But I don't feel it more because you do. I measure it by your agreement with me. I don't measure it by how much you feel it, the effectiveness of the prayer. Well, God's restoring the tabernacle of David. He's raising up this, uh, which again, it's Jesus' throne in Jerusalem. But before he returns, we're seeing the Holy Spirit raising up this worship intercession dimension around the world, preparing for his return. And then when he returns and establishes his throne in Jerusalem, the worship ministry won't end. It will go far beyond where it was in the decade leading to his coming. But we can see it right now. It's already increasing in a dramatic way. Roman numeral two. I like to use the phrase, the mystery and the majesty of intercession. Intercession is the most powerful aspect of the kingdom, whether you feel it or not. And it's not, again, about emotion. It's not about volume. You can be on row 10 and not just whisper it, and he hears you, and it matters. It really matters if you do it. People talk about, well, I want to get on the microphone. You don't have to be on the microphone. The group singers go, well, we're the three group singers. When I really get to sing, it matters. Let me tell you, it really matters if you will say those words to God if nobody hears you on a microphone. That's what the prayer ministry is about. You may have no role at IHOP. Your body may be sick and broken. You may have no energy, no strength, no money. You may not have any gifts that you can define. I don't even know if I have a gift. You do, but some people think I don't have one. Everybody can do this. And it's the most powerful access to the, king, uh, access to the power of the kingdom. The problem is you can only measure it accurately after years, not after weeks and months. There's a delay. There is so much happening right now in our midst because of the prayers that happened years ago. Because that magnet of God, which again, the biblical term is the influence of the Holy Spirit is what I mean. That invisible hand is moving things in a way that we cannot match to a particular prayer meeting, but we can link it to a decade or two decades of continual prayer. Well, the majesty of intercession. Why is it, why do I call it majestic? Because God has chosen it as the primary means to release his power in this age and the age to come. I mean, it's majestic. Consider this. Back in Genesis 1, the father had a plan. It was the father's plan. But the son of the son, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, he's the one that spoke it, let it be, that let there be light. He was, in fact, in the principle of intercession. The father had a plan. The spirit was moving over the earth, but the earth was still formless and void. But when the son spoke, then the power was released. Beloved, he created the earth through the principle of intercession. He told God what God wanted him to tell him. Here we're talking the uncreated God, second person of the Trinity. He is engaged in intercession. Beloved, that fact alone makes intercession majestic beyond anything we can imagine. The fact that Jesus, it's his primary way of releasing the power of God through the Holy Spirit. That's how he releases his power now. He's praying at the right hand of the Father, and we're praying on the earth, and the more we're in agreement, the more he releases over time. Whether you feel bad while you're agreeing, or you feel nothing, it still works. It's agreement, and it's the blood of Jesus that makes it work. Then in the age to come, with a resurrected body, you will still be involved in intercession. I mean, we have one of those few job descriptions that will never go away. We'll be doing harp and bowl a lot better forever. A billion years from now, you'll be doing harp and bowl. 
Jesus, look at it, says Hebrews 7, lives forever. He always lives. Or one translation says he lives forever to make intercession. Forever Jesus will do this. Jesus, what is it that you get about intercession, about telling your father what he tells you to tell him? What is it that you get that we don't get about it? Well, it's so mysterious. The reason I use the word mysterious, it's so simple. We simply tell God what he tells us to tell him. It's so simple, anyone can do it. It's so simple, few people do do it. I believe that what the Lord wants to strengthen at at IHOP is the prayer. And I was talking to a few earlier today. I said, I'm going to talk to the house of prayer about prayer because I believe we're We're not nearly optimizing the amount of effectiveness we could with this size of staff in a prayer room. Because a lot of folks are sitting in the room, I'm guessing. I'm not interviewing them. I'm just guessing. And we're using it for anointed background music. And that's good. I like anointed background music. But there's more going on. We're in this. God called us here. He says it's so simple. But I, I want you. Whether you're playing the bass, whether you're a group singer, whether you're in the, in the soundboard, whether you're on one of the rows, whether you're not sure, when they say it or sing it, I want you to say it too from your heart. Just say it. You can whisper it. Lord, touch Detroit. Just if they say it and sing it, you say it. Not, you know, not every phrase, but about every third, second, third, fourth phrase. It's very easy. I like it because it's the easiest. I don't have to think of nothing. I can sit there tired. A lot of things going on, and just whatever Dwayne says on the microphone, I go, I just say what he says. That's easy. And but I want to focus my mind on the throne. Well, that, that that worked. And the Lord's answer is, that's all I ever asked. That's all I asked. That's all I asked. That's all that it takes. And to live a life in agreement <clears throat> with me outside of the prayer room. Not just agreement in the prayer room, but agreement with him outside of the prayer room. It's so simple. It's mysterious, the end of paragraph B, in its weakness. It's so weak. That's part of its mystery. Surely, this cannot be that important. And the Lord says, surely it is. Consider, this greatest men of God of history, prayer was what they did most of. You at, you tell me, the Lord might say, is it important to me? It's mysterious in its simplicity. It's mysterious in its accessibility you can have the most broken life you could be on a sick bed a deathbed you could be in prison you can be anywhere in the most desperate situation and you can still say things to god from your heart and it moves god as well as if everything was going well i think one of the great untold stories in our history we've kind of whispered at a time or two is lou engel it was back in the 70s. Lou Engel, he had a vision to be in ministry. He didn't know if it was ever going to happen, you know, to be in full-time ministry. And for several years, Lou mowed lawns eight hours a day. It's the only job he could find, mowing a lawn. He took it. I'll take it. Eight hours a day, and he talked to God. And what God was doing was raising up, in my opinion, he wouldn't like this, but one of the chief intercessors In this generation, in a nation, by mowing lawns, talking to God in 100 degree weather, sweating, bees flying around, you know, just, uh, I said, what was that like? It was horrible, but I just talked to God. That was the furnace that God was forming a man 30 years later that is obvious to me, one of the chief intercessors, though again, he would just hate that statement. He'd be like, please, that embarrasses me, because he didn't believe it. But does it matter if he doesn't believe it? It's true anyway. But how did that happen? Guy mowing a lawn. Well, if I finally get a job, a big position and a big role, finally give me a microphone, I'll engage with all my heart. Lou was just hoping one day that he could be an assistant somewhere on a church staff and do something. See what would go from there. The Lord says, I can imagine. The Lord says, Lou, do I mean, I don't know that he said it to him, but he could have. Lou, you have no idea what's happening. You're far more effective pushing this lawn 
mower than you will be in the busyness of A, B, C, D. Now, God was forming him, and I think it's a great story that needs to be told more often. It's brilliant to me. The, the beauty of God, though Lou didn't appreciate it, I'm sure, in that hour. Maybe he did. Let's look at uh, top of page two. Roman number four. Jesus creates. He sustains. He governs. All the same way. Initially, he created. When the, Lord, when the Father said, I have a plan for light to fill the earth. The Spirit was hovering over the earth. But the earth is dark. How could it be that the Father is approved for light to fill the earth and the Holy Spirit has plenty of power to create the light, but there's darkness? Because they were waiting on the intercessory decree to say, let there be light. Father says, I've already approved the plan, but it's not going to be released into the earthly realm until somebody says it. Holy Spirit says, I'm here. I have plenty of power. I can create light effortlessly. But I won't do the Father's plan until the Son says it in agreement with the Father. So there's a point in time. The Son says, let there be light. And that was the intercessory decree. That's the intercessory principle that the creation of the world was founded on. Beloved, what is this thing called intercession? One thing I'm convinced of. I do not have much revelation as to the glory and the majesty of this assignment. And I know that as a ministry, we don't really have much understanding of it. On a scale of 1 to 10, we may be a 1. I mean, really. Some other groups are a 0.5, so we know twice as much as they do about prayer. But we're only a 1. I want to get to a three or a four or a five, and then we'll take it from there after we get there. Those are arbitrary numbers, of course. But what I mean is, I go, Lord, I don't really see it. I I can see the fundamental principles in the scripture. I want to see it more. I want IHOP gripped with the revelation of intercession. I want our faith, meaning our confidence. Faith and confidence I use interchangeably. Confidence. That what we offer in weakness ascends in power, though we may not be able to measure it for some years down the road. If we have that faith that the angels are moved and they're singing in our dullest prayer room. Maybe it's the, the emptiest room in the most difficult set in the side prayer room. Does it matter? The angels go, we're not moved by your music. The music moves you. We're moved by your agreement. I mean, can you imagine how good the music they're used to is? The music that they're accustomed to is so much better than the greatest symphonies of the earth. So we say, well, you know, our instruments aren't this or that or the sound, this and that, or the the bass or the electric or this or that or the singers. And the angels go, no, no, we are as high above the New York Symphony And you, it's the same. You guys are both so low compared to the music we're used to around the throne. Your music isn't what moves us. I'm all for excelling in music, but the most excellent we can get, we will be so many, so low, much lower than the music that they're used to. They're moved by human beings just sitting in the chairs, standing on the platform, saying it with agreement and believing that it matters. Actually, it matters. I said, Lord, I want to see this more. Well, Jesus not only created, I'm in Roman number 4, A, he not only created by intercession, by declaring what the Father was thinking, he sustains the world this way. He upholds everything by his words. If Jesus quit interceding, the earth would wear out and it would just, something bad would happen. Let's just say it that way. He energizes the entire created order by speaking. And then the spirit moves. And I don't know how often he speaks. So one guy says every moment. I don't think it works that way. But he speaks and there's the spirit puts the energy of God into the cosmos, the created order. I believe the spirit is responding to Jesus' words 
in the sustaining of the universe like he responded to Jesus' words in the creating of the universe. That's how important it is. Paragraph B. When Jesus articulates the Father's thoughts, what the Father's plans are, Jesus says them. Then in that way, he's functioning as the Word. I mean, his name is the Word. He's called the Word. Why is he called the Word? Well, there's several reasons. One reason, he brings the Father's idea into existence in the earthly realm by speaking the Word of the Father. Because he speaks it, and it's in the Father's heart, the Spirit moves, that's the order within the Godhead, Jesus acts, he rules, he creates, he sustains by speaking, by intercession. What is this thing that God has called us to? Intercession in the spirit of the tabernacle of David. He said it audibly, I am establishing it. That's what he called us to do here. Yes, we have 85 departments, so we have 84 other functions, but... The primary thing he told us, I want you to tell me what I tell you to tell me in the spirit of the tabernacle of David with prophetic music. I want you to do it, and the earth is going to be filled with it. And then when the Lord returns, it's going to fill the earth far more with it, because that's what's on his agenda, to run the government of the kingdom from the earth based in worship and intercession. Beloved, we're doing it now. I talk about being forerunners. And we typically talk about telling the plans of the Father in the unique dynamics and the generation of the Lord returns. That that's part of the forerunner messaging. That there are these unique dynamics, positive and negative, and we make them known so people won't be afraid or confused or deceived. But they can say, yes, we agree. Forerunners do that. But the most dynamic forerunner thing we're doing is that prayer room exists. It's a little prayer room, you know, X amount of 100 people in it, pretty weak. I love it. It's my favorite place on the earth. But, I mean, there's not much power that's obvious. And the Lord looks at it and says, I love that little room. And I wish that you loved it like I loved it. I love it more. The Lord loves that room more than any of us love it. He sees the power of it more than any of us. But in the forerunner sense, he could say to us, Do you know this, at a much higher level, is going to fill the entire earth, leading to my son's return, and then multiply far beyond. When he's here in a physical body, on the earth, in a physical throne, he will see to it that it goes up a level worldwide. He'll have a lot more than 85 departments to worry about. So what we're doing, the very act of it, is a forerunner ministry. But the the thing that that I'm, I'm stirred by... And I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to be encouragement and just kind of a wake-up call. I'm just wondering how many people sit in the room and only have background music for other things. That's not a bad thing. I'd rather you you sit in that room and have anointed background music than sit somewhere else and other things happen. But so much more is on God's heart. He's saying, do you understand the nobility that I have called you to to simply agree with me? In your weak way, say what I tell you to say. Most of what he tells us to say is already in the Bible. And there are are subjective promises. And we say what he tells us to say. He goes, my son does it forever. He creates that way. He sustains the universe that way. He'll rule eternity that way. Why don't you do it? And the most remarkable thing, he actually called us to do it. I mean, most of us in this room have some sense of an assignment from the Lord. Others more clear than others. But many of you in this room, there was a time three years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago where he made it clear he wanted you to do this. You don't feel the emotion of that initial assignment today because that's how the kingdom of God works. When God gives an assignment, we feel that emotion, that excitement, the the emotion wears off because he wants us to do it because it's truth, not because we feel ecstatic or exhilarated all the time. Because I want you to do it because I told you to do it. You felt exhilarated when I first told you. But now, you don't need the emotions. I want you to have confidence that it moves me. Look at it. It moves my son. My son lives this way, and everything he does, he does it through intercession. Let's look at the top of page 3. 
I just gave a few more examples there at the bottom of two of how Jesus defeats his enemies. He speaks the word. Say, well, Jesus, he could skip that. He went to the cross, rose from the dead, he already defeated him, but he still has to speak the word. You mean Jesus, who went to the cross, still has to, by the word of his mouth, I'm talking about in these days and the years ahead, it's by, he has to, in addition to the work on the cross, he says things to the enemy in his intercessory ministry at the right hand of the Father. And he says, I want you to do this with me. I hop, do you know the majestic, noble calling I've given you that's so weak, but it's so dear to my my heart, it's so central to my kingdom economy that you would tell me what I tell you to tell me. Look at my son, the premier intercessor. He creates, he sustains, he defeats his enemies, he governs, he does everything through intercession and he wants to do it with you. And all he needs is you to whisper the phrases and you'll be in unity with him. Well, I'm waiting to fill it more. Then I'll whisper it more. The Lord says, I have an opposite. I'm waiting for you to whisper it more to me, and then you'll fill it more occasionally, but it won't matter because I will fill it, says the Lord, whether you do or not. Again, that, we're top of page three, that encounter with that angelic choir, and that marked my heart, and sometimes I lose sight of that, and I stop, and I remember, I go, yes, this empty prayer meeting where everything's off. Off key, off this, off that, at every level. The Lord says, it's not a problem to me. I love it. I love that little prayer room. I, mean, I don't mean just I, I'm just everywhere. I love it. My, my angels are so excited. And I buy faith, meaning by confidence in the written word of God. I want to look at this and say, I buy this. I buy it. Roman numeral five. Well, justice, we know it. This is a passage we're so familiar with. Luke 18. We can lose the wonder of this glorious truth. We got it on the wall. It gets preached all the time. The message of justice being released through night and day prayer and the message that God loves us and His beauty. We have language for it. A little bit of language. But it's so familiar, we can lose the wonder of these most magnificent concepts and truths and realities. I mean, here Jesus is, the ultimate Social reformer. He said, I will reform every society of the earth. And some of it I'm going to release before I come there, but I'll finish it totally after I come. But I will do all of it through night and day prayer. All of it on both sides of my coming. That is the most remarkable statement. There never was a social reformer who as the premise of his entire government, was people saying to God what God said to say to him, and to do it continually. And the reason he wants us to speak it, because he wants to address injustice in the realm of the Spirit, where injustice has its great power source. How could I, sitting in a chair, no one even hears me, you know, the guy's on the microphone saying, Lord, touch Visit in Detroit, and I go, Lord, visit Detroit. That, are you kidding? The Lord says, no, I'm not kidding. That's real. And if you say it, more will happen. If you don't say it, less will happen. Really. That's what the Bible says. I thought we believed the Bible. Well, we do theoretically, but that seems a little extreme. Beloved, that's just Bible 101. It's remarkable. I remember the... The analogy, it was, so, I mean, the story that so impacted me, when our boys, Luke and Paul, a year apart, they were about, you know, four or five, I guess, five, six, something like that, I can't remember. And I came home, this is 25 years ago, plus. <laughs> I came home and one of them was there on the chair and water everywhere, Diane's hair was wet and water was everywhere, it was a broken dish. Walk in, I go, whoa. Well, you know, my first thought is, man, what happened? I didn't say it. I walked walked in, and my son turned around and says, Dad, I did the dishes. I said, really? Diane says, well, actually, I took a plate, washed it with his hand on it, handed it to him and washed it, then took his hand, helped him put it under the water. He dropped the plate, fell in the water, splashed everything. Diane's shirt's wet, her hair's wet. 
He did the dishes. Instantly. I mean, it was like a word of wisdom. I went, I get prayer. I built a ministry. Lord says, yeah, you did. You sure did. There's water everywhere, broken dishes. Yeah, you built a ministry. I built a ministry. I mean, that's cute, but it's actually profoundly true. The whole human race, I'm talking about all of redemptive history. God gave us the dish. He helped us wash it. He helped us rinse it. He helped us dry it. And we dropped every third one. And we did the dishes. He wants partnership. He goes, I can use everybody in my kingdom. That's how my son runs the kingdom. And that's how his eternal companion will run it. And I mean, we'll in partnership with him running the kingdom. Middle uh, pa- paragraph C in the middle page three. It's one of my favorite verses on prayer. Philippians 1.19. Philippians 1.19. Paul says this. This will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers. Here's what Paul's saying. Church at Philippi, I need deliverance. And he didn't mean uh, he had a demon. That's not what he's talking about. He says he's in uh, great pressures, people attacking him. He goes, my prayer, I can't get past a certain level. There's a ceiling on how far I can go with just my prayer. I mean, Paul the Apostle was a very anointed man of prayer. He could only go so far. He goes, I can't get free of this attack except some saints help me. And if they'll help me, the ceiling will be lifted and I'll get through it. They didn't have microphones. They didn't have like, you know, get the bass and the drums just exactly right. And everyone's, you know, put a little... Fix the EQ, little reverb in it, and in Philippi, they could all feel it, and Paul finally gets free. No, it was one guy over in this little house. I mean, they had no good communication systems, no cars, buses. It's one guy here, one guy there, three guys there, four guys there, two guys there. They together added something to Paul's prayer life he could not do apart from those 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 people who prayed 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times. That was it. But the ceiling lifted. Paul went to another place. He couldn't go without them. And that's not because the Philippians were so awesome. That's because prayer is that effective. Paul got it. He goes, here I am, man of God, anointed man of God, wrote half the New Testament. But you know what? There's a ceiling. I can't, unless, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 of you join me a a few times. I can't get through it. I can't. This man understood it. I could just imagine what the prayer meeting was like where they were in the, the Philippians were at. It was not some dramatic light show, perfect sound, everybody intense feeling, everybody enraptured. It was a guy here, three there, four there, two there, and that's how it was. I'm talking about the dedication of the church. He says the same thing in Second Corinthians. Now, Corinth is the most carnal church in the first century. The only church that was equal to Corinth, uh, to Corinth was Laodicea. They were top two bad churches in the Bible. Paul said, you guys, oh carnal Corinthians, you can help me. If you will agree with God, even in your state, it will actually get me to the next place in, my, in the place where I need to get free from this thing attacking me. I say, Lord, if the Corinthians can get Paul to the next level, I know. That you are listening to the prayers of your people. I think the most shocking prayer story to me in the New Testament is in Acts chapter 10. I don't have it on the notes. Cornelius. Cornelius, Acts 10. Acts He's a Gentile. Okay? He doesn't go to all the Jewish meetings. He doesn't have a lot of Bible study. He's a soldier. Which in today's world could be either soldier or a marketplace guy. Because there a lot of marketplace and soldier, they were connected. That's another story. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He's not born again. He doesn't have any cool worship tapes. So he's in no Holy Spirit, very limited knowledge of the Bible. He didn't go down and buy a Bible. I'm talking about a dull prayer meeting. His three or four guys. 
I could picture it really dull. And the angel breaks in in Acts chapter 10 and says, Cornelius, your prayers are remembered before God. I could just picture this just like that uh, angelic choir experience I had in the, in the 1980s. But Cornelius, would be, it'd be worse. He had no Holy Spirit. At least I had vineyard worship tapes to go with. And I had nothing. No Starbucks, nothing. Just Cornelius, raw, unanointed, no Bible knowledge, four Gentiles sitting in a building. And the angel is so moved, he breaks in and goes, Cornelius, God was removed and will remember all your prayers. When I, that verse hit me one time some years ago, I go, I'm in for good now. If that kind of prayer meeting can move God, I got it made. Because what God's after is within reach of us. He's not looking for something other than he's looking for us to simply do the work of prayer, which is to actually agree with what's being sang and said on the microphone. Now, there's prayer outside the prayer room, of course. I'm talking about what we do in the prayer room. Beloved, you go home. It's been 15, 20 minutes, whatever the time is. Do a little praying as you come and go. Much more will, will happen. Whatever level is happening, more will happen. You may not see it in the next few months. It may, you may not see it for a few years. But I promise you, it is impossible to stop God answering prayer. But it's a faith issue. Because though we say we're by faith, we actually do it by how we feel. We do it by emotions. Meaning we, get, we engage or get excited about the feeling in the room. And the Lord says, no, get excited about the fact you're agreeing with me. That's what moves me. Roman numeral six. Jesus, you just read that on your own. He's going to rule the nations in the millennium by intercessions. He's going to make decrees and he's going to ask God and God will give him. And in the middle of page three, Roman numeral six, paragraph A. And the Lord says, you will possess the ends of the earth. The word possession, the idea, the transformation of the cities of the earth is in this concept. He's not going to just have the legal title deed to the property. It, he's going to possess those cities. He said, Jesus is going to make decrees and he's going to ask the father and he's going to do it in partnership with his eternal companion, his bride and the cities of the earth. He will possess them entirely. They'll be utterly transformed, all of them before the end of the millennium. And it's going to be through intercession. There'll be other lots of hard work, but intercession is the primary thing. The Messiah is mandated to do in the Bible. Look at paragraph B. Now, you may not get this at a quick reading, and I, I'm not going to take time on it. But Jesus, David hears Jesus at the right hand of the Father. The Father and the Son, they're talking. So the Father says to Jesus, hey, sit down, Son. So Jesus has died. He's raised from the dead. He's ascended. Now he's seated at the right hand as a man with a resurrected body. Because you stay here. I'm going to bring your enemies under your feet down there on the earth. Okay, how? I'm going to send the rod of your strength forth. You're going to stay here and the rod of your strength is going to go out. And you're going to rule even while your enemies are still on the earth. In other words, the devil's not in prison yet. The wicked are still abounding in the earth, but you're going to rule. You're going to break through with kingdom power. You're at the right hand of the Father. Your people on the earth are speaking your word. It's called the rod of his mouth. Amazing. The rod of his strength goes forth. And while there's wicked men on the earth and the devil's not in prison yet... Jesus is ruling in power. Not all of his enemies are, are uh, vanquished immediately. Eventually they all are. But he's doing it from heaven through a praying church. That's the point. And beloved, the saints through history, they're like us. They're prone to ten things, whatever they are. Prone to think too much about themselves. Prone to depression. Prone to quit. Prone to get frustrated. Prone to get mad. Prone to get guilty. Prone to sin. Prone to quit again. That's what, the, that's, what the, that's what humans are like through history. So we don't look at ourselves and say it cancels us out. It doesn't cancel us out. I look at it and I go, that's how it really works. Because of who Jesus is and his grace, folk like us, it, this is all that, uh, that's all we need. We need broken people like us that are prone to a bunch of uh, negative things. 
Stay with it. When we feel like quitting, we sign up again. We feel like quitting, we write our resume, we sign back up again. We just keep signing back up. Everyone on the earth, believer and unbeliever, they're all tempted with quitting. People tell me that all the time. For 35 years, I feel like quitting. I go, the whole human race wants to quit. A couple times a year, the whole human race wants to quit a couple times a year. The sinners want to quit. They don't know what they're going to do. The saints want to quit. They haven't thought it through. The only option is to just join the devil. They don't want to do that. Sometimes I'm mean and I go, quit. Quit what? Well, you know, just quit. Like, and just, like, serve the devil? No, 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 not that. Like, was there a third option, like the neutral zone that I don't know about? (laughs) Well, no. Quit do what? I don't know. haven't got that far in my thinking. Just quit. I go... You know what? All the sinners and all the saints, at least a couple times a year, they all think it worldwide for 6,000 years. So my point is, guys like us, it still works. We just keep signing back up to go wholehearted with God. I'm not, I'm not talking about quitting IHOP. That's not my point. I'm talking about quitting pursuing God hard on his terms. Look at that, the rod of his strength. Even while his enemies are going. Now, the most amazing thing to me is Jesus is in the millennium Ruling the nations through intercession and the devil's in prison. There isn't even a devil on the earth. They're all in prison and Jesus is praying and leading more prayer than any time in history. There is no devil. How, like, how much more should we be engaged in this with an active devil on the earth? Jesus is going to lead the whole body of Christ forever into a level of intercession with no enemy. But still, intercession must go forward. Intercession is not just about the enemy. Intercession is about partnership with, with God in releasing his power, the rod of his strength on the earth. Yes, we do it in the presence when his enemies are still on the earth. But we're going to do it when his enemies are gone. But if the saints with resurrected bodies are going to pray... How much more should we pray now where there's so much at stake and so much peril at every hand? Beloved, our work, yes, we all do work, but our primary work is prayer. Prayer is work and the work is prayer. Prayer is hard work. People say, ah, just kind of go join IHOP and they're kind of imagining, you know. You know, I have some good music, some good coffee, some cool people. Like, I'd, yeah, it'd be fun to go out and join IHOP. I'd love it. I go, have you ever prayed for a couple days in a row? No, you know, have you ever threw a little fast again? No, it's work. And it's hard work to bring your mind, to bring the reins of your mind into agreement with what the guy or gal are singing or saying on the microphone. It takes work because your mind wants to go far away. You bring it back. And no. Again, group singers. Bass players, electric guitar, keyboard, sound techs, ushers, and everybody else in the room. Let's say, you can whisper it. Let's say what they say and what they sing every third or fourth time. Let's do it. We're at IHOP. Let's do this thing. Let's look at bringing this to an end. Let's go to the top of page four. I have seven things here and four. You could just read it on your own. But I'm just going gonna, gonna to just let you know it's there. Look at this. This is the wisdom and the weakness of intercession. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I love this verse. This is a great intercessory passage. It's more than an intercession. God is called the so-called foolish things. That, that means prayer and, and all the other things. Fasting, believing, giving, serving, enduring persecution. God, all those things are included. God has called what the world calls foolish. Sitting in a room and telling an invisible God what he tells us to tell him. And we don't feel anything, beloved, that's foolish to the natural mind. You're sitting in a room telling an invisible God what he tells you to tell him. You don't feel anything and he doesn't even answer you for five or ten years in a way you can tell. Well, he answers lots of times in little things. But I'm talking about the historic breakthrough type things. may go on a few more decades. He goes... You mean this delayed payment program? You don't feel anything? He's invisible? You sit in a room and you feel depressed? You feel like quitting? You just stay with it? Like what? That's what the world calls foolish. God has called the foolish things. 
to shame the things men call wise. What men call wise is build without taking time to work to connect with God. That's what wise is to them. Building with all of their strength without taking the time to put in the effort to connect. They think that's wise. And Paul says, they think that's going to triumph over what you weak people are doing in prayer. He goes, it's not. God has chosen the weak things. They will put to shame these mighty coalition of strength with no connection with God. Because it takes work to connect with God. Because our natural mind wants to run left. We bring it back right. The minute we get it back right, it goes left again. We bring it back right. Say, oh, just go left for a while. No, bring it back right. And let's say what God says. Let's agree with God. Let's gird the loins of our mind and let's stay in this thing. Because that's what changes things. Not enduring two-hour sets in the prayer room. It's not how many sets you sit in with background music. It's how much we pray. That's what moves God. Not how many sets we sit in with background music. He wants us to actually talk to Him. Because I just want you to talk to me. I love you, and I know you love me, but I want you to put the effort in to talk to me. And I, like all the great mighty men and women of, of history, that's what they did most of. And you don't have to be in a prayer room to do it. I'm not even talking about sitting in a prayer room. I'm just talking to that to us about that because it's part of our occupation. Okay, look at paragraph C. When we intercede, I'm not going to go in this, just let you read it here. It internalizes the word. We're interceding, but the word, every time we say the word, it goes through our being. It's very small impact, but thousands of times, it's like rewriting lines of code in your inner man. You're speaking the word because his words have spirit and life on them. Lord, release your power in Detroit. That will mark you ever so small, but it'll mark you every time. If you say it to God and not just to the air, you got to say it to God. D, it unites us. You will love the people you pray for or the places. Whoever you pray for, you will love them over time. You, that's just an, that's an irrevocable law of the kingdom. Still, D, I'm going to skip one or two. I love this one. It makes a long-term impact. Do you know the prayers you're praying for a person or a city? Those prayers will continue to have impact a thousand years from now. It's not like you pray it and it's over. The prayer has meaning to God. He doesn't forget spirit-inspired prayer. And I don't, I don't even mean you feel it when the spirit inspires you. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, because it's agreement to God. Your prayers for your children, for your city, for anything, they last way beyond your natural lifetime. They really do. The next thing I have in paragraph D, in... Uh, Prayer intercession gives us an inheritance. You will have an inheritance in any person, ministry, city you pray for. You pray for Jerusalem in the age to come. You will have a, an inheritance in that city related to your prayer now. You pray for Egypt. You pray for Siberia. Whatever you pray for, whatever person, whatever ministry, whatever broken person, whatever struggling ministry, you will have something that is yours in God that's in their sphere in the age to come. You have an inheritance in them. It's real. You may not even catch it all in in, the, in, in this life. You might catch a little of it in this life, but in the age to come, we will be shocked how our prayers give us something in that city and in that person and in that family, that ministry in the age to come. Paragraph E. This is another one of my favorite ones. And I'll end with this. Intercession causes multiple blessing to return back. It is impossible for you to outgive God. Impossible. You've heard people say that about money. It's true. But you can't outgive God on love. You can't outgive God on service. You can't outgive God on prayer. The law of the kingdom is based on the nature of God. He loves, He loves cheerful givers. I don't have the verse there, but 2 Corinthians 9 7. He goes, I love a cheerful giver. Why? I am a cheerful giver. I love to give. You pray, you think I won't multiply that, apply that thing back on you. You pray for that broken family down the way. That prayer will come back on your family, even though your family may not be broken. That prayer will boomerang back. That's not the right term. That prayer will come back, and it will actually touch your children. 
You pray for those three broken kids down the road that are struggling with this or that. You don't even know their names. You know their face. You pray for them. It will touch your children and grandchildren for years. Lord says, you think you could pray for Jerusalem and it not come back and touch your city? You think you could pray for London, Siberia again, and it not come back and touch your city and your, and your family? Do you know who I am? I am the God who loves giving. I will give every single way I can find it. I will multiply everything you do and get, turn it back tenfold upon your head in blessing. We're sitting in a room by divine assignment. We're a little weary. Body's tired. Money's not coming in. We didn't get the spot we wanted. Or worse, you did get the spot you wanted on the org chart. It's got this kind of boring. It was more fun being mad about not getting a spot. Now that I got it, it's like, this is it? You've got to be kidding me. Like, I love Misty's testimony. She had the big one thing conference. Misty, you're right. She was so scared. Like, there was 10,000 that year. The first year, it kind of was a little bit big. And she goes, I'm thinking, well, whatever, whatever, whatever. And she goes, I got up there. I was totally bored. I go, you got to be kidding. This is what I was thinking about? I just thought it would be different. And if I didn't touch God, there was nothing in it. She goes, ugh. And I go, now, the problem is, is that you might get the position you want. And then you got the disillusion of it. There's nothing to it, really, without connecting with God. But I tell you, it will turn back on you in such blessing. It is amazing. God loves to multiply it back on you. Amen. Let's stand. Let's recommit ourselves to IHOP. I mean, really to God. That's what I'm talking about, to the mandate. Here we are, Lord. Lord, I, I want to say yes to intercession. Lord, this weak thing that moves you, I'm in. Lord, I repent for all my negative emotions through all the the 30 plus years, whatever. I say again, like I've said a thousand times, I'm sorry, I I break my agreement with that negative, slothful emotion. And I say, I'm signing back up to partner with Jesus, and I believe you that it matters. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm ending with that. Got you out three minutes late. Okay. (laughs) 